Uh, we're going to hear from God's word together now. Uh, in case you're wondering, um, we are reading the same passage as last week. If you're like, Brad's just doing the same sermon as last week. That's right, I am. No, I'm not doing that. Different sermon, same passage. I'm going to invite up Mira to read the Bible for us. We're in Genesis chapter 1. It's page 1 of your pew Bibles. Um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through to chapter 2, verse 3. Thanks, Mira. Give the people time to shuffle pages. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form only, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, it was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters of the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seed and fruit trees, fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed according to their own kind, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be signs for, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give the light on the earth, to rule the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and everything living, every living creature that moves with which the waters swar swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth, according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that grows on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has a breath of life, 
I have given, given every great thing. And it was so. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it whole because of it. Yeah. Because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Uh, friends, I want to paint two pictures for us as we get started. Uh, number one, I want you to pretend that you are making a, an Airbnb. So that means you want to rent out a place, you know, short term for people. And so the story of you making an Airbnb will be to construct a granny flat. I guess you're going to make the actual building. And so you get the timber and the plasterboard and the PowerPoints. And you do all of those things, right? So there's a material aspect to this. But once you put on the last coat of paint, you still have a long way to go, actually, before it is ready to be leased out, rented out as an Airbnb. So you're going to need to like get the right regulations. You probably should talk to council about that because you're changing what you're doing. Uh, you should get nice photos. You need someone with a fish oil lens to come in, take nice photos, make it seem like a bigger room than it actually is to put on the internet. So people come along. Uh, you need to talk to Airbnb themselves and um, you know get affiliated, whatever that means. Uh, you need probably insurance. I don't know. I guess. And the funnest part is you need to go and furnish it with nice white things. I don't know. That's always white in Airbnbs. I don't know why, but you get those things. You need nice smelling soap. So the soap always smells good in Airbnbs. And you need to get seven different types of tea leaves. Like that's an Airbnb thing too. You need to get all of those things ready. Um, and once you're set up, once you've gone through that process, are you finished? Well, no, it's time for the actual work to happen. So that's one picture of setup and then work changing. It's finished, but it changes. Uh, another picture. Let me paint another picture of something really similar. Uh, pretend you're running for president in the US, which is within the realms of possibility for most of us, right? And so pretend you're running for president. I don't even understand what they do, but they have a long election process, like years it feels like. And so you enter into the process and you're, you know, doing the tours and you're shaking hands and kissing babies and, you know, talking lots. There is the whole campaign trail that goes for a long, long time. Costs a lot of money, lots and lots of talking, lots of stuff. There is a whole process leading up to that point. And then, of course, there is a moment when you're elected as president. Uh, and then on the day you take up the Oval Office, is your work done? Well, on one hand, it is, campaign work is done, but on the other, no, not at all. Your work is only just beginning. In fact, if you had a president who said, look, I'm going to call another election as soon as I can, because I really, really enjoyed that campaigning thing, you would go, we elected the wrong president at that point. All of those things, um, both of those things, there are material aspects to the setup, but there's lots and lots of non-material things that get to the point of having things function and set up, and then, once it's all set up, is the work finished? No, the work just begins. It changes, but it just begins. So, today, like this relates to the passage we just looked at, today we're going to tweak a few things. We read, you know, Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to tweak a few things. So we're going to tweak the process. We're going to see that there's a bigger process going on in the seven days of creation, we'll tweak three things. Tweak the process, we'll look at that from a different angle. We'll tweak rest, so it talks about God resting. We'll tweak rest, and we'll tweak the purpose of Genesis 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 3. So three things, let's look at those, let's tweak where we've been coming from. Last week, if you remember the big storyline of Genesis chapter 1, remember we talked about it going from chaos... Uh, without form and void was the word. It's like a place where you can't grow anything. You can't, it's not productive. It goes from that and God orders it through the days to something that is abundant. The spaces are filled. 
It's complete. It's got tenants in them. Remember, it went from desolate, useless, to abundant, ordered. And we see the humans. Remember the word for, you know, Adam. We are the Adams. It's used generically in chapter 1. And so the Adams get to rule over the place. And we finish with that summary verse, you know, and it was very good. Now, is that, like, does this just tell us that we occupy a particular place and um, God on the seventh day gets to rest and because he likes to set a good example, he rested on the seventh day, so from now on we take Sundays off. Is that the point of Genesis chapter 1? You can tell that I'm going to say that, uh, that seems a little too easy, doesn't it? It seems like we're missing something if we end with the big highlight at the end of day six and then God takes the day off, has a sleep in and has brunch. Like that actually doesn't seem like enough. And I want to say, like last week, remember last week I said we are tourists. Even though we've had this text as Christians for a long time, we are tourists in the text and so it belongs to someone else. We're separated by time and culture and place And so there's some things that we need to see that we don't necessarily see straight away. So here's what it is. Here's something else going on. Um, When you build a temple, which we haven't done, like we haven't built it, I don't think any of you have built a temple before. It's not in our culture, time, place. When you build a temple, you'll spend years getting it ready. You've got to get the large stones and you've got to get the gold and the incense and all of the stuff. But when you finish putting the last coat of paint on the temple, is it ready to go? No. Actually, when you build a temple in the ancient world, you need a whole process, a ceremony, to dedicate it. You need to go from function to, essentially, what was believed, God dwells in this temple. And so you need a process for that to happen. You need it to function, but then you need to dedicate it. And so... We know from other nations at that time that was a big deal, but we also know when we open the pages of the Bible, that's what happens in the Bible too. So we get a tabernacle in Exodus, which is a tent. It's a, it's a temple on wheels, like it's a portable temple. And we read in Exodus 40, it's all complete, and Moses takes some time to dedicate the tabernacle. That's a thing that goes. We don't know how long that took, but that's something that happens. And we know when Solomon builds the actual temple in 1 Kings 8, 2 Chronicles 7, Solomon dedicates a brand new temple, he gets it all ready. Um, Guess how long the process took for him to anoint it, to celebrate it, to get it ready? It took seven days. That's how long you take to get a temple ready. I don't know if you can see the parallel already. Seven days to anoint, to inaugurate is the big word, a temple. You're essentially getting it ready. What seems to be going on in Genesis chapter 1, the thing that we miss, because we don't dedicate too many temples, is that this is actually a ceremony setting up where God is going to take residence, where he's going to rule, where he's going to dwell across a whole cosmic temple. The whole world is going to be his place. We don't pick it up because we don't do temples. We just don't understand that. It's like, you know, imagine if in 2,000 years someone in Australia comes across an inscription and it says, that is going straight to the pool room. We understand that that's a quote from um, the castle, uh, but they all read well. Obviously, they had pools and they were indoor, but they they miss completely what's going on there. And so we miss this. We miss what's going on. So we consider, and it was very good to be the end of the week, the summary But notice, no, if this is temple inauguration, we get to the seventh day and this is the big day. This is the day when God, not us, we occupy, we are sixth day people, but the seventh day is when God sets up his rule. He is king and more than that, his presence is now in the place. We miss it because we don't know about temples also secretly because we want to make it about us. We want to make it about us and we rule and we get dignity. Yes, we do. But ultimately, this is actually about God. We need a tweaking because we all need the tweaking that goes. We need to take our eyes off us and our story and shift it onto God, opening our eyes that God is indeed the one. If this is a process of temple prep, 
Day seven, those three verses, everyone in the ancient world goes, ah, temple prep, now God is in place. His presence rules. So let's tweak. Let's look at it from this angle. We're not used to it. We don't prep temples. Let's look at it from there. So second thing then, that means we need to read the rest stuff again. We read in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, that God rests on that day. What's the deal with God having a rest on day 7? Was he tired? No, we know that's not the case. Uh, Remember, we are tourists, and so we need to look at the text really well. First thing we need to notice is... God actually rests from something. It doesn't just say he rests. We're told twice, actually, that he rests from the same thing. This is what it says, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he'd done in creation. Uh, What is God doing? He is resting from something in particular. What is it? The work of creation, the work of ordering, the work of setting up function. Uh, We think of rest as stopping, and so we should. There's a whole bunch of reasons why we should do that. We would be wrong to go... God is now doing nothing. It's time for, you know, whatever we do to relax, you know, scroll socials, sleep in, whatever it is. But we actually miss something. God is resting from what he had done. If this is temple set up, if it's day after day, seven days, working toward the moment when God sets himself up as ruler, and I want to say sustainer of the cosmos, Is his work done, you know, is the work day done and time for a sleep in? No. This is the moment of the Airbnb and the president campaign. This is when he finishes one lot of work, the setting up. It says that. He finished his work. And now it's time for the real work to happen. It's time for the real work to begin. The ancient picture is that now the temple is complete. It is the control room of the cosmos. And the God in that area, in that time, or our God, takes control. He takes his seat at the control room of the world. Um, Notice, notice then, if this tweaks, you know, oh, for a reason, notice it doesn't talk about the eighth day. Does God go back to work on the eighth day? No, we're told actually that this seventh day is just existing all of the time. We still live in the seventh day. God has finished his creating, ordering work, and now he rules and he reigns. He is still the God at the helm of the cosmos. Um, Understand, this continues through the Bible. In John chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus gets chipped by the Jews for working on the Sabbath. He should be stopped. And what does he say in verse 17? He says, my father is working until now. Jesus got the picture of God at the control room, at the helm, of the cosmos, and he says, and I am working. Why does he work on Sabbath? Well, because that's what God does. And so we're told that God was at work in one way, leading up to six days, and then he starts work in another way. Now, some of you are thinking, isn't this, isn't God giving us an example? He rested, so we rest. Like, does this mean if God's just working on the seventh day, then we should get on with work too? No, I'm not saying that at all. But I do want us to see this is the best sort of rest for us. We're not God. He is. He can work for six days in creation and he can work on the seventh day in a different type and he can do that. For us to rest then, Sabbath, Shabbat, as the word is, it is all about not stopping. It does mean we stop. But you do need rest. There is a moment when you do need sleep and if God is at the controls... Our Sabbath, our rest, our stop is actually about correct relationship. If he is the one that's at the controls, then I can afford to stop and let him keep going. I want to say it does inform our rest, definitely. Uh, I've said before, one of the greatest worship acts you will perform today is when you lay your head down on the pillow and finish all your worrying, all your striving, all of the things and hand it back over to God for eight hours when he doesn't sleep or slumber. 
Maybe it's six hours. I don't know how long you sleep at night. But understand, this is telling us that if God is in place, ruling over the cosmos, we can rest. And in fact, that passage that Terry read to us from Hebrews, it's a confusing, hard-to-follow argument. But part of the reason for that is that writer of the Hebrews, Hebrews is picking up on this idea and going, if we're in the seventh day and God is at the helm, God's in the control room, he says, then resting is like the gospel, that he has done all of the work and now it's time for us to stop. In fact, the greatest rest you can enter into is when we stop running from God or we stop trying to please him and we just go, Jesus has done it. He's actually going to say that's the greatest seventh day rest for us because God has indeed done it for us. Notice, what is this passage doing? It's informing our world, right? It is telling us the way it is. Um, a contrast for us to help. Uh, if you watch documentaries, if you enjoy watching documentaries, you put on a documentary, uh, it tells you something true, it's about reality, like that's the power of a documentary, it informs you. But where do we watch documentaries? We watch documentaries sitting on my lounge chair. And so, you know, I don't know what that... Remember, you know that one where the polar bear's swimming at the end? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? David Attenborough. Does anyone... Like, someone nod, please. Thanks, Jeremy. Not sure. Right, good. Uh, and we go at the end. You know, there's meant to be a moment where we take action and I'm on my lounge. Well, that's really sad for the polar bear. That's what we do. Maybe you don't do that. But there is no imperative for us to act. Um, another sort of video that we might watch, if you go onto a mine site or any sort of regulated workplace, you'll have an induction video. It's like a documentary. It has real live things, but you're not watching that on a lounge. You're watching it on an uncomfortable plastic chair normally. And it is informing you of what life is going to be like when you get up from your plastic chair. It is expecting you to function completely differently having watched it. It's going to tell you who's in charge, what the penalties are going to be from not living that way. It is going to do all of those things. Genesis chapter 1 is informing us there is someone ruling the cosmos. He is not to be trifled with. He is gracious and generous and compassionate, but it means we need to live according to his way. Um, so let's do the last thing, third thing. Uh, so if we've tweaked what this week is, if we've tweaked our view of rest, yes, we rest, but God just changes what he's doing. And number three, let's look at what the purpose of this is. Let's deep dive into it a little bit more. If this is telling us about our world, what's it telling us? Um, imagine who this is first written to. Who is hearing this for the first time? Genesis chapter 1. We believe that this is first told to those Israelites who have come out of Egypt, out of slavery, they're in, they've done the Exodus, we read about it in Exodus, and this is Moses informing them of their world. That's who's hearing this for the first time. Here's a bunch of people who have only ever known what it is like to be slaves. They don't know what it's like to have a day off. They don't know what it's like to have an ordered world. They just do as they're told. They don't know the dignity that God bestows on them. But more than that, they're also getting introduced to who this God is. So they're standing in the wilderness, hearing from God, ex-slaves learning how to be the people of God. Kind of like us. We are ex-slaves learning how to be the people of God. For those hearers, they know all about temples. They know all about the week, the inauguration, getting a temple ready for a God. They know all about sacred space and God's doing that. That's just the world they live in. They know that all of the other nations have these things. Um, we know that those other stories are dehumanising, that they don't grant the same level of humanity to these ex-slaves. But here they are and they hear about God and his ceremony for setting up his temple, not in a local place, you know, on the corner of Short Street and wherever the local temple happens to be. They hear about a God who rules over the whole cosmos, that his presence is everywhere. And remember, they've seen this. It's not just talk. They've seen God walk the walk because he does indeed overturn the superpower of the day, the Egyptians. They're told that God is not some local God. They're told that he is God. God, ruler, 
We're told that he, they're told that he is the God at the controls of all things. They're told that we take our place under him. They're told, they're about to be told the law, how to live under him. They know it's time to listen and to hear him. Understand, as they hear about this, this God, there is no other God like this. There's stories like it. But there's no other God that explains himself like this. There's no other God that invites them to live this way. There's no other God that rules. There's no other God that is generous and good, gracious, glorious. They're getting told what's at the heart of the universe. They're getting their world formed. That there is indeed six days of setting up. There is chaos to order, but there's a God who rules and reigns, which isn't surprising for us. We've hung around churches, but understand this is building our world. Um, I wonder if you can appreciate, if we make Genesis chapter 1 about material origins, it's all about the way things were created, we actually miss some of the impact that was on those original hearers. They are going, ah, oh, there's a God who rules. Uh, we, there's a God who reigns. He's like the other ones. There is temple inauguration, but now we know he is at the controls. We have a God who's like that. Um, let's go, Remember last week I said, right, let's finish with a takeaway. Let's finish with a takeaway container. Uh, let's make our takeaway container a little bit uncomfortable. Look, I'm, I'm not sure about the metaphor and how that's working here. But um, let's go, a takeaway container is a little bit uncomfortable. Imagine that I have a time machine. Imagine the piano is a time machine. We gather around it. We touch the time machine. We go back to the original hearers, the Israelites of the Exodus. And uh, we say to them, imagine, like, imagine we say to them, look, um, we, we have this thing where we think that Genesis chapter 1 is all about um, seven-day creation and the science and we've got to hold a particular line against the evolutionists. They would say, what? What are you talking about? Like, I don't know about that. I, that isn't this about temple inauguration? Like, isn't this about God being on the throne? Isn't this about him changing from one work of creating to another? And I want to say, when we make it like that, we take on fights that we don't need to. I want to say that. I think that we are doing something we don't need to do because the text wasn't made to do that. Let's make this uncomfortable on the other side. Two takeaway containers. We touch the piano, we go back, and we go, OK, so look, original hearers, um, we know that it's a non-literal seven days and there are actually long periods of time and there's evolutionary processes between days one and two and three, you know, whatever. I think, again, they would go, what? No, we know about temple inauguration. It takes seven days. Like, we have a ceremony where we celebrate it every year. It takes a week. That's when we feast and we do that stuff. And so why, like, don't make it that either? And so... Understand what I'm saying. We are particular materialists. We love to think about the material things, but I think we miss the meaning of the text, that this is something that is describing to us who God is, who we are. Um, I think that we often go, um, we want this to answer the what and how questions. What was it like? How was it formed? When this is actually answering the why questions. Why did God do this? Uh, why did he make us like this? Why is he king? It's answering meaning and purpose. I think we're in two different businesses and we don't need to see the conflict between those two things. Um, let me finish with a picture. One more picture to paint. Imagine you're going to a play and you're late for whatever reason. Uh, I can identify with this. I'm late. Uh, and you're 15 minutes late and you do the thing where you, you, know, you squeeze in. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, and they fall down seats. And you get in there and you lean over and you talk to the person next to you that's been there from the start. Uh, you, you're quite abrasive in this illustration, sorry. And you lean over and you say, um, uh, how did this play start? And a person leans over to you and they say, well, the script was originally written in 1923 in Melbourne by such and such. And you say, no, 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 I don't, I don't mean that. How did the play start? And they're like, oh... Yeah, so uh, the, the company that built the set was Smithfield Constructions Co. And you're like, no, 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 not that, not that. Uh, and you say, how, how did the play start? And you're like, oh, OK, so the actress, she came directly from Paris and they sourced, you know. And you go, not that at all. 
how did the play start? And I go, oh, I know what you're asking. And the person says, well, actually, it's a love story. Uh, and they fill you in on the things. And in some ways, Genesis chapter 1 is saying, this is a love story. It's about a God who ordered and shapes the world. And though this world gets bent out of shape and led into disorder again, it's about a God who is doing everything, everything, giving up what is most precious to win back the people out of slavery. That's what this play is all about. We get hung up on how is this set built. We can get hung up on that because we're such materialists, but we're not meant to. We're meant to see the beginning of the story. Uh, we lean over and say thank you to the person because we're not that rude. Let me pray for us, and if you've got questions, let's do it over a cup of tea. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you lead us in your word. I pray, please, Lord, that you'd help us to be people who are wise. Uh, I pray that you'd help us to see what you're saying to us. Lord, to be people who are not insecure, but founded strong and solid in you. I pray and ask, please, Lord, that you would lead us that we might be your people and that we might love being and understanding your word and living. We pray this in your name. Amen.